press the button. All right. In theory. Man, I have so many browser windows open and something made a bleep bloop on my computer and I have no idea what it was. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, I, I must have about 40 tabs open right now. Mostly they are t background tabs on Star Trek for the, uh, for the role playing game that we're running that I'm game mastering. So I've got a lot of, of sort of background Borg uh, story information. I never played that one. Well, so, we're, so the game that we're playing is this game called Lasers and Feelings, which is uh -huh. a one page version of a role playing game that you can sort of go through very quickly. So you can bring people up to speed who haven't played a lot of role playing games. And oh, someone's telling me it was a Discord sound. Oh, maybe, yeah, maybe it's Discord. Um, mm -hmm. anyway, and so um, I'm running a. Uh, oh man, this is so nerdy. You guys are all gonna have to follow along here. So we're watching the new Picard show, and 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 in the Picard show, they're they're taking apart this board cube. And I was noting to my wife, I just want to see stories in the board cube where they're finding new technologies and just you know, ex having adventures with all this crazy Borg technology. And she goes, oh, yeah, it'd be like Borg pickers. So just like every week, just, you know, <laughs> and so we're like, yeah, that's it. And then that somehow got turned into a uh, campaign. So now I'm running Borg pickers, the role playing game <laughs> for for my wife and her friends who are trapped around the world. So it's it's very silly. I'm going to say hi to a bunch of people. I know. See, that's how far the rabbit hole went. Uh, Hello to Adam Synergy, Adam Cowley, Ben Kahlo, Beth Johnson, Bob Moeller, Brad Hoog, Hooge, Hoog, Brexit Denier, David Dunn, David Fairweather, David Rios Mora, Eric One, Horizon Brave, Ian Farkeron, John Musk, Johnny Zed, Luke Duke, Nancy Graziano, Neil Yu, Paranor, Rich Wilson, Arjone, Scott Bragdon, Sergusi, Visto Tutti, and William Hutchings. Hey, everybody. Uh, I said Ben Kahlo. For everyone who doesn't know, uh, uh, ben Kill is this awesome designer, and he did. He's doing uh, woodcut drawings of the Apollo missions, and they're awesome. I will, uh, I will try to share them on some of my various media at some point. But, but check out if you do do a search for Ben Kilo. Um, all right, we'll start in just like a couple of minutes. <laughs> People are saying nerd, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, nothing wrong with being in there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see what else is happening. Okay, we're at the five minute mark. Everything seems to be stable. Nothing's broken. So let's uh, put you all back in your boxes and let's focus this on me. All right. Here we go. Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, April 22nd, 2020. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today, and this week we're going to be talking about uh, new information on Venus in Messenger Data. Uh, Fulhout B, planet, goes away. Uh, the collision of two black holes of vastly different masses and the last photograph from the Spitzer Space Telescope. Joining me this week, I've got Dr. Pamela Gay. Pamela. Hello, Fraser. How are you doing this evening? Good. Uh, now, you've got a really cool second broadcasting location where you've got that wall that's right behind you, but this is a green screen. What have you done? <laughs> <laughs> so if behind the green screen there is brick that clearly shows signs of our house being on fire at one point in the past right. and and so that brick is hidden with a green screen that i have green screen brick on top of so, so that it's brick all the way down so you've got you've got a brick behind you but you've put green screen in front of it and then you're now broadcasting different brick yes i don't get it <laughs> It, it's it's honestly because if I was in my other location, I, I, I was fussing with my lights, and the other location doesn't have lights right now. 
no, no, it's fine. It's fine. I, I think it's awesome. Uh, we've got, uh, let's see, we've got Alan Versfeld. Alan. Yes, hi. And you, and you, you also have <laughs> a, a green screen background. I'm going to get, unless you are actually out in space right now. I wish I was. Now, this is a picture I took about five years ago uh, from my backyard. Now, there Imagine we go. a cloud and, uh, uh, can you see it? There yep. we go. Uh, Tuck 47, the finest globular cluster in the whole sky, I think. Fantastic. And we also yeah. got uh, Moya McTeer. Moya. Hi. I'm so sorry I don't have an interesting background. <laughs> yeah, that is just like a bland uh, background. Yeah. Maybe a pillow. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm in the bedroom because I'm in a, a small space with two other people and they're being loud. Right, you got to be careful. Yeah. You got to try. You got to choose your your uh, your COVID quarantine partners carefully. You do, <laughs> or at least consider the acoustics of the location that you're going to. <laughs> Uh, all right, so before we get into our special guest this week, I just want to give a big thank you as always and uh, a heartfelt encouragement for all of you to join our good friends at the Weekly Space Hangout crew. These are our executive producers. They are our friends. They hang out with each other over the summertime to talk about space and astronomy while we're not broadcasting. And so if you want to be a part of this amazing community, go to wshcrew.space. They will uh, give you your uh, executive producer credentials, business cards, and let you get out there and invite guests to the show. And speaking of guests, for example, we've got, whoops, hold on a second here, get my information. Okay, we've got uh, Dr. Fred Watson. Dr. Watson, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. Thank you very much, Fraser. It's great to be here. Thank you for the inv invitation. Much appreciated. Hey. Well, I should say... Good morning, because that's what it is here in Australia. That's right. You are well, and good morning, and also tomorrow, uh, and tomorrow as well. Yes, and of course we're in autumn as well, which is all <laughs> right. <laughs> Happy autumn Thursday morning yeah, thank you. from Australia. <laughs> um, uh, so, who are you, and what do you do? Um, my job is uh, one with some people think it is the coolest title in the universe. Uh, I work for the Australian government. I am Australia's astronomer at large, the very first one that they've had. Uh, and it means that I do anything I like. No, no, don't, don't say that. Um, it means it's a, it's a kind of um, advocacy and outreach role. A lot of it is about doing exactly what we're doing now, which is brilliant. I just love it to bits. Um, but there is a kind of grown up component as well when I have to front up to committees and things of that sort. Uh, my history is uh, that for 20 years I was the astronomer in charge of the National Observatory here in Australia. I was looking after the Anglo-Australian Telescope, which has a mirror 3.9 metres in diameter, slightly better than this one here. But yeah. I love this one nearly as much as I love, as I love the AAT, the Anglo-Australian Telescope. Uh, and my, my career has been one of uh, a mixed bag of instrument building, of research in... Um, pretty well every aspect of what goes on in the universe, um, from asteroids to quasars and the and cosmology. And, and I suppose that's what lets me um, talk, uh, not from a position of knowledge, I'm a jack of all trades, master of none, but it lets me talk about most things that are going on in space science and astronomy, which might be why I've got the job that I have. <laughs> right. And so, uh, you know, what are the kinds of projects that you have been uh, moving towards since you have all this freedom. <laughs> How long have you got? <laughs> uh, the, the, the uh, 20 stuff. minutes, give or take. <laughs> Thanks very much. Actually, it's probably 18 now. Yeah, 18 um, minutes. Use them wisely. The stuff, the stuff I'm involved with at the moment is very much uh, concerned with Australia's national effort in astronomy. Um, so, you know, I, I'm still connected with some observing projects. I'm a member of uh, a consortium called Galar, and a Galar is an Australian bird, uh, but the name of the project is an acronym for Galactic Archaeology with Hermes, and what that tells you is we're uh, observing the intimate details of uh, about two million stars using, again, the Anglo-Australian Telescope. And uh, one reason why a lot of my career has been about what we call survey astronomy, you know, gathering information on either galaxies or quasars or stars, uh, uh, in, in large numbers, so you can do population census studies, things of that sort. One reason why my career has gone that way is that back in the 80s, along with 
um, along with uh, collaborators, actually not in your country, uh, Fraser, but the country to the south of you, uh, I helped to pioneer the use of fiber optics in astronomy. Uh, we, uh, there were about half a dozen of us who got together and said, we can do great things with fiber optics. And everybody laughed at us. But of course, uh, now we're doing it. Um, the instrument that Galar is, uh, is working on uses 400 optical fibers. That means you can look at 400 stars simultaneously. When I started my career, and it was a long time ago, you always did this one at a time. There was no way of doing more than one with the kind of quality of you know, the spectrum, the, the rainbow spectrum with that barcode of information. We couldn't get that any other way than one at a time. So that's the background, the backstory. Um, but what I'm doing now is, apart from the outreach stuff, uh, Australia, uh, two years ago, uh, entered into a strategic partnership with the European Southern Observatory because for many years, Australians have recognised that, uh, as well as the four metre class telescope that we have here on Australian soil at a place called Siding Spring Observatory, the Anglo-Australian telescope I've just mentioned, as well as that, we of course need access to eight metre class telescopes. Uh, and uh, the more the better. Uh, and Australian astronomers being focused very much on the southern sky uh, have always yearned for membership, actually, of the European Southern Observatory, which you, of course, will be aware runs the, the four uh, telescopes of the VLT, the very large telescope yeah. at uh, Cerro Paranal in northern Chile, which sadly, uh, along with most other facilities in the world, is currently in lockdown. Uh, so the strategic partnership was forged between the Australian government and ESO in 2017, and that means Australian astronomers have access to that. So I'm Kind of involved with that right, right. but on home soil <clears throat> um, australia is a, a leading partner in something called the square kilometer array which as its name implies will eventually be a telescope with one million square meters of collecting area that might not be till the 2030s but at the moment where uh, we're working on <clears throat> just about to start actually construction of what's called ska low one low refers to the low frequency end of the spectrum which we have here uh, we'll be observing here in Australia, in South Africa, there is the mid frequency uh, range. Um, both Australia and South Africa are operating uh, pilot versions of this uh, array. It's called Meerkat in South Africa. We have something far more prosaically named. It's called ASCAT, which is the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder. <clears throat> we don't go in for good names. Meerkat's a brilliant name. Um, so um, that and another thing called the Murchison Wide Field Array. These are working telescopes now in what is probably the most radio quiet region of the world, uh, in Western Australia, where things like this simply don't exist. Uh, uh, no microwave ovens, yeah. it, it's absolutely radio quiet. So that is the big project that Australia is involved with. The Australian government is part and parcel of that. I help where I can, yeah. usually talking about it as I am now. So we talk a lot about, you know, some of these other mega telescopes. We talked about James Webb and W first for space telescopes. We talk about some of the ground based telescopes that are coming, like the extremely large telescope, the Vera Rubin telescope. The square kilometer array is one that maybe doesn't get quite as much uh, media, but you know, it is a gigantic step forward in the in the field of radio astronomy. What kinds of things, you know, will will people be able to expect to see when the when the full telescope becomes operational? Oh, I think you're muted. There we go. Yeah, there Sorry. we go. <laughs> Easy to do. Yeah. Um, look, uh, the the SK. When you look at the science case for it, it covers the whole history of the universe. Um, it, it's um, you know it's it's got this enormous collecting area, and really, I guess the motivation for that, when this was first being dreamed up back in the in the seventies and eighties, actually, uh, was uh, to uh, look at the dark ages directly. That period between the Big Bang and the first star switching on when what you've got is cold hydrogen. Cold hydrogen is visible to radio telescopes. Uh, it's highly redshifted, of course, because the expansion of the universe since that period, you know, 13, or perhaps 13.5 billion years ago. Uh, so that is one of the targets, to not just to detect the, um, the, 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 the period when the first stars were switching on and before that, but also to map it, to look at the way the universe you know, what, what did it look like uh, uh, so, you know, a, million, a, a million or 10 million years after the Big Bang? And the SKA has the 
has the wherewithal to do that. But, you know, it will also look at galaxy evolution. It will look at uh, gas flows in galaxies in quite recent times, in other words, at relatively close distances. Uh, and um, one of the things that uh, amuses me too, and I'm not sure how seriously my colleagues take this, but it's a fact uh, coming rather nearer to home, it will detect uh, an airport radar at a distance of 50 light years. Yes. So, um, you know, uh, that's that's something that feeds into uh, the, the search for extraterrestrial yeah. intelligence, of course, as well as, as, as life. More yeah, it's broadly. kind of a fascinating topic. You know, we've in the past, we've talked about how, in, you know, people are always worried about us transmitting uh, yeah. our signals out into space and will the aliens be able to detect us? And the answer has always been not really, you know, the space is, you know, the, the signal, you know, goes down quite quickly over distance, <laughs> but then now with a big enough telescope, turns out you actually can detect the leaked radiation from, a, from an intelligent civilization. So, you know, maybe they were right to be worried all along. Um, it's um, Steve, Stephen Hawking, of course, expressed that uh, very cogently. He was dead scared about yeah. uh, advertising our presence. But honestly, uh, and Seth Shostak of the SETI Institute says this all the time. We've been advertising our presence for decades and yeah, decades. Yeah, so I've, if they're there, they know about us. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of our past co-hosts of the Weekly Space Hangout, Nicole Gallucci, is fond of saying uh, uh, oxygen itself has been advertising our presence here for about 500 million years. So yeah. so the jig's up. The, uh, the, the, good, yeah, the good news. Sorry, sorry, Fraser, go ahead. Oh, oh, that's it. Yeah, please continue. Okay. The, the good news is, um, you know, when you talk to astrobiologists, and I talk to a lot of them, uh, the, the the good news is that they're probably not there. Um, <laughs> it's not our neck of the woods. Yeah. <laughs> because, um, yeah, the evidence seems to be uh, that uh, life like ourselves might be extremely rare in the universe. So that is why we've got to look after ourselves. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's sort of a... Uh, that was kind of a c conclusion that I really came to as well, which was like, if we are alone then and again i forget exactly who said it but you know the universe it sounds like a carl sagan thing but you know the universe is an awful waste of space if we are it, it, alone it was carl sagan yeah yeah and and you think boy you know we really have to do we have to take care of our planet we have to ensure that we don't wipe ourselves out with climate change or <laughs> you know, I don't know, a global pandemic, for example, exactly. um, because <laughs> wouldn't it be sad if the universe yeah. ended up without any, you know, intelligent life uh, or life at all beyond, you know, because we wrecked it. Way to go, humanity. Um, I, I would like to talk to you as well, just a bit about this idea of surveys, because one of the things that really fascinates me is, is how you know, in the olden days, uh, astronomy was very much a point a computer at an object and gather some data and then write a research paper. And now it's very much about about computer science that you are trolling through these gigantic surveys of data that have already been gathered, things like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and, and some of these other surveys that are being done. And that really does feel like we're entering this whole new revolution with like, say, what's about to happen with the with the Vera Rubin telescope, where you've got petabytes of data dumping onto the internet you know, every couple of days. So what you've got to do is turn to citizen science, which of course the Sloan survey did uh, very, very successfully, I have to say. It's um, uh, citizen science is, uh, I think, one of the great uh, ways forward for astrophysics, particularly when we're gathering all these data. Um, for uh, about 10 years, I was projects, uh, project manager for a survey with the delightful name of RAVE. Uh, so we were all ravers. Uh, and had rave ops. Rave is the radial velocity experiment. It was actually uh, a, an international venture that led from Europe, but the observations were made on the UK Schmidt telescope. And I, I have, so we gathered data on really high quality data on velocities and physical parameters of stars for about half a million stars. And I've always felt we missed a trick that those data are freely available, they are online, but we've never gone out and said, this is a fantastic citizen science project. You might find things in these spectra that we've missed. Um, and so I'll put that on my to-do list today, Fraser, to yeah. get that order. Okay, great, great, great. Now, um, you you have a book. Oh, yes, I do. Thank you. No problem. Which is called, 
exploding stars and invisible planets. But unless you live in Australia, <laughs> right? <laughs> Cosmic Chronicles. Sorry, the same book. It's the same book. I don't know quite why that's happened. But um, but um, so you'll see that lovely picture of uh, V838 Mon on the front cover there, uh, a light echo very close to my heart. Um, this book is really, uh, the idea was that it would uh, essentially summarize all the great things that are going on uh, in astronomy today. There is a chapter on citizen science, actually. There's also a chapter on why we might be alone. Uh, all of the kind of thinking that we you know that it's probably your daily stock in trade Fraser the stuff you talk about every week on the on the space hangout uh, it's kind of encapsulated in here it's uh, up to date as of about um, uh, September last year uh, it came out in January published if I may mention by uh, Columbia University Press in the USA Wonderful. thank you very much uh, end of end of prompt <laughs> end of prompt end, end of shameless self promotion now normally uh, we uh, this is the point where I usher our special guest off to uh, to whatever it is they want to do with the rest of their evening but you have chosen to stick around maybe because it's morning and you've you know you're all hopped up on on coffee but whatever it is you're going to stick around for the rest of the show with us which is great because i think there's going to be a bunch of topics that are in your wheelhouse but if uh if people just do want to follow more about what you're doing what's the best place for people to follow your work okay the, the easy one is to check out the space nuts podcast uh, so Space Nuts is every week. Uh, we've got uh, about 30,000 listeners, I think, something like that, um, maybe more, who write to us all the time. Uh, it's, uh, so I do a lot of radio broadcasting here in Australia. And one of my host interviewers actually retired uh, a few years ago. And we said, well, why don't we keep going? So the Space Nuts podcast came out. And you can find that on most platforms, I think. Um, but there are websites too. Um, my partner, Marnie, who's I think just trying to get in somewhere. I just heard her hitting the door. <laughs> she runs, uh, she is uh, actually a part of something else that was very close to my heart when I was running the observatory, and that is Dark Skies. So she uh, uh, is the CEO of the Australasian Dark Sky Alliance, and her website is darkskytraveler.com.au, which tells you all about the things that we do. It has a page about me as well, and also is the uh, is the gateway to a new series of webinars that we've been doing uh, under the banner of Cosmic Relief because we can't go out there. We've got to yeah. give people some sort of relief. So we talk about everything. So it, it, I'm very easy to find. But Fraser, thank you very much. Thanks again for having me as a special guest. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you so much for, for joining us. And we're not, we're not done with you yet. This is, uh, go. we've, got, we've got more to talk about. So uh, Pamela. Yes. Why don't you tell, this is the big story of the week, I think, the uh, the explosion of a planet, maybe, around Fomalhaut. <laughs> so, so it wasn't quite a planet. Uh, a number of years ago, back in 2004, we first observed with the Hubble Space Telescope a bright splotch of light near the star Fomalhaut, which is a southern hemisphere star that uh, is only about 25 light years yeah, away. Yeah, super close. Yeah, yeah. So it was really exciting because this was an object that was like well separated from its star and it didn't quite behave exactly the way we like our planets to behave. It, for instance, wasn't bright in the infrared and we normally expect planets to absorb heat, get warm, and then re-radiate more light in the infrared than they're receiving from their host star. And this one did not do that. And it appeared like physically bigger than it should and and so in our determination to keep this a planet the explanation was after they'd observed it for a number of years and it continued being there and they could see it moving on a trajectory that it seemed to be more of an escape trajectory than an elliptical orbit but we were going to ignore that um the the explanation was this must be a world that is surrounded by a dust cloud but as we kept observing it, it kept getting bigger and bigger and fading because the bigger and bigger made it uh, less photons per square bit of space on the sky, less light per square arc second is the way we put it in astronomy. And um, it eventually went away <laughs> completely. And, and the explanation now, having done a good deal of computer modeling is that this object that was on an escape trajectory rather than a normal planetary elliptical orbit 
that didn't give off light in the infrared the way we expected was in fact the leftover bits of two icy bodies that slammed into one another. And, and the way to think of it is if any of you have been following the, the demise of the comet Atlas, we look at it now and it's this dispersion of icy bits and gas and dust that's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, instead of being a, a single comet that self-destructed, it's thought that two, probably 200 kilometer crush-ish objects in the icy debris field that surrounds Falmohad anyways. It has essentially, call it a Kuiper belt, an Oort cloud, whatever you will. It's surrounded by icy bodies. Two of these probably just decided to have a really bad day, slam into each other and create this dissipating object. Now, the exciting part is, well, we know stuff slams into stuff. It has happened enough times in our own solar system. We figure it's got to be common everywhere. Well, this is a short period event. It's just over the past several years that this object has gone from bright to can't see it. And, and so this implies that right before we observed it, it had this, this collision. So this is something that start to finish probably all happened in this century. And that's kind of awesome mm -hmm. that this happened this nearby. We caught the whole thing in the act. We got super excited that we saw a planet that wasn't actually there. Yes. But what we saw was even more cool. Yeah, not going to lie. Yeah. I have shown off this picture several times and gone, check this out. This is yeah. a picture of a, you know, normally we no. just get these radial velocity measurements or transit measurements. But here's a picture of a planet. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> we were wrong. No. So wait a we minute. So is it, is it dust again? Yeah. It's dust. Everything keeps going to gas and dust. Gas and dust. And, and here, there, there used to be an icy pair of bodies that were a mixture, we believe, of ice's volatiles, dust. When you inject energy into that, all those volatiles, well, they go back into a dissipated phase that drifts away and is hard to see. The dust. The dust is really friendly about reflecting light, however. That's what we were seeing. So I guess what, you know, apart from the disappointment of not having a nice direct image of a planet and now calling Who's it... Who's disappointed? I'm excited. I kind of liked having a picture of a planet. That I kind of like, like knowing we caught things smashing into each other. Well, and, it, and strangely, I mean, at this point, we have seen potentially pictures of another planet orbiting around Proxima Centauri. Exactly. Or maybe not. Maybe it's another comet smashing into <laughs> another comet, right? Maybe all planets are just comets smashing into each other. No. The point is... Everything's been flipped upside down. But what can astronomers learn from seeing this expanding debris cloud? Can this teach us anything about our own solar system? What's it well, good for? It, <laughs> it, it gives us a, a sense of, well, first of all, our solar system, as we had hoped, is not special. Things slam into each other everywhere. And it is through these interactions that we can toss things out of solar systems. For all we know, there are some Comet Borisov-sized chunks that are going to come flying what? out where once there were two 200-kilometer across icy bodies. Dwarf planets have hard lives in other solar systems, not just here. And, um, well, worlds collide and the fragments move on. I wonder if the... I guess the material that's seen in this dust cloud can be used as some methodology for finding either maybe events that have happened not quite so recently around other around other star systems that well, you may look for a certain are, kind of signature in the These in are the star. such transitory events. Mm -hmm. I this this it was first discovered in 2004. So from collision to can't see it anymore at only 25 light years away, we're looking at 15 years or I guess 16 years at this point. And with something so short lived, we were lucky to have caught it once, so amazingly lucky. I think our best bet is to continue to look for these kinds of collisions and hope that they're common, that they happen with a clockwork, like we didn't know Jupiter kept getting collided with. So the hope is maybe these things occur with the same frequency that we see Jupiter eating comets but in all likelihood 
we're not going to get this lucky anytime soon. And I really hope I'm wrong, but short-lived events, hard to see after 15 years, even at 25 light years, that's just not going to give us a powerful handle to look for the remnants of past collisions. What do you think, Fred? <laughs> Uh, I um, so so I, I had a dumb thought there actually during uh, during Pamela's conversation uh, because uh, you know the the other news story that uh, I've been talking about this week is the modelling of Oumuamua, um, yes. the, the idea that you know this um, was the result of tidal disruption by uh, an object passing too too close to its parent star, and I wondered. Uh, so clearly that resulted in an e ejection and Oumuamua sailed through our solar system a couple of years ago. Uh, I wondered to what extent some of these fragments might be big enough uh, to become interstellar wanderers, a bit like Oumuamua is, uh, as, well as, um, as well as Comet Borisov, another one mm -hmm. too. Uh, it's really interesting, right, that, that the, the structure of Oumuamua is explained by some icy object being shattered. And then I think, Pamela, you described it in Astronomy Cast, getting cold welded back together as it was flung through the, through the universe. And maybe this is the kind of event that sets off these, these sorts of objects out into the, that some of these objects are going to get some kind of escape velocity. They're going to be torn apart. They're going to reform together. And maybe we're actually getting a chance to see it in, in action. That's a, that's a pretty interesting uh, way to look at it. Absolutely. You're the best guest host we could have hoped for. <laughs> um, Moya, what have, you, you, uh, what have you got for us? Yeah, uh, so I'm going to talk about black hole mergers. But first, I want to say to Dr. Watson that I am using GALA data in my PhD project right now. So thank you for making something that will get me through my PhD. Um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> um, so on to black hole mergers. On April 12th, 2019, so a little bit over a year ago, LIGO detected a black hole black hole merger from about 2.4 billion light years away. And this wasn't the first black hole black hole merger that LIGO had detected. They actually have about 10 confirmed detections so far, but this was the first merger where the two black holes involved were of very different masses. Most of the time, the ratio of the masses is one. Uh, but in this particular merger, one of the black holes has a mass of about 30 solar masses. So it's 30 times the mass of our sun. And the other one is eight times the mass of our sun. So that's a very different mass ratio. Um, normally, in the other mergers that LIGO has detected, uh, the merger, the collision of these two black holes sends off a signal that we receive as one constant frequency. And that frequency actually happens to be twice the, the speed of the orbit, um, like twice the speed that the two black holes are orbiting each other with. But in this case, because there are two different masses uh, involved, uh, we get multiple frequencies in our observation, which is really interesting. And it confirms one of Einstein's predictions in his theory of general relativity, which is you know, something that astronomers and physicists are still actively trying to do, confirm different parts of Einstein's theories. Um, one cute thing is that researchers say that the, the two frequencies that, you, that they observed in this merger uh, formed a perfect fifth, and I'm not enough of a musician to know exactly what that means, uh, but it's apparently the same interval that you see in the opening, core, the opening note of Elvis's I Can't Help uh, Falling in Love With You, so that's cute. Um, so theorists, <laughs> theorists uh, think that this can help us learn how binary black holes or pairs of black holes actually form. And they have uh, two different ideas for mechanisms that can get to uh, binary black holes. The first is that the black holes actually formed from a pair of binary stars uh, that were both massive enough to turn into black holes after they went through their main sequence lifetimes. The second idea is that the two black holes form separately in different parts of the galaxy, but they over time are gravitationally attracted to each other as they both are going along their separate orbits around the Milky Way. Uh, researchers think that this that the first uh, mechanism, the one where the two black holes form from a binary pair of stars, is more likely in this scenario just 
because of what the mass ratio is. Um, if the mass ratio were larger, so if, if the, the masses were more different than each other, uh, the second scenario would be more likely. Uh, but there is an astronomer at Johns Hopkins University who wants to make this an even more exciting detection. Uh, and he thinks that the more massive black hole in the pair might actually be the result of an earlier merger. So we might be looking at a multi-generational merger, which would be really cool. And we haven't you know, seen evidence of that before. Um, so there are still a lot of unanswered questions. So in sorry, this. what is the, um like what is what makes this researcher think that it might be that the 30 mass one is already the result of a multiple merger the fact that it's so massive uh i think that right now it's kind of unclear how you would get a black hole that massive without mergers um just because stars don't get that massive, right? So, so sorry, just, I mean, when we think about the, the, the mass of the black holes that have merged so far with some of the earlier, they're in the teens, right? Times the mass mm -hmm. of the sun. We're seeing stuff that's like what, like 15 times the mass of the sun, 18 times the mass of the sun. So is this one of the, on the more massive side of mergers that have been detected at yeah, 30? Yeah, I think so. And, yeah. and then eight is, is almost certainly on the low end of masses of black hole mergers that have been that have been detected. And so we're kind of imagining two st two massive stars in orbit around one another, one goes off, and then, you know, a few million years later, the other one goes off, and then the two are right. spinning around each other and eventually make their way in. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of, I wonder what the, what is the limit? Dr. Watson, what do you think? What is the limit of, of this that we might detect? What is the most massive and the least massive that we should be able to see in these kinds of mergers? Uh, so what you've been saying so far is absolutely right. My recollection though, and, and, and it's in here, I was just trying to find it, uh, is that the first black hole collision detection was two black holes which were around the same, around 30 solar masses, because I think the, you know, they, they lost um, something like three and a half solar masses of, of uh, radiated gravitational energy. So that in itself is a curiosity. Maybe because this was the first detection, you've got the strongest signal. Although, um, I, you know, gravitational wave detection is a, a, a really strange art. It doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily about the most massive object. It's, it's all about the way they come together, the distance and all the rest of it. So um, I think, you know, your, your estimate there of eight to 30 is probably about right. Um, uh, the, uh, the, it's a really interesting notion that we're seeing the idea of a black hole that has already collided with another one. Um, I'm struggling to think what might be a characteristic of such a black hole, though, other than its mass is more than we can account for by stellar evolution. Well, what is the, is great. what's the limit, right? Like we get to, we get a black hole that is, um, like I know beyond a certain size of a star, they just blow themselves apart and there's no remnant remaining, no black hole mm -hmm. can form. Yes, that's right. So yeah, and you're right, and it's of the order of 30 solar masses. It's that in, within that kind of size range. But clearly, there's nothing that stops black holes growing. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't get uh, behemoths in the middle of uh, in the middle of galaxies, supermassive black holes. So, uh, I guess what we're seeing here is just the very start of that process. Um, you know, mergers taking place, uh, which could act as a model for what uh, has allowed galaxies to grow their giant black holes in their centers. Um, Moya, your field is in exoplanets, and now you know we don't get out of uh, we don't really get too excited unless it's like the first of a or the most massive of the or whatever. Uh, <laughs> you know, can you maybe give some? Uh, you may be able to give some advice to the to the black hole uh, to, to the gravitational wave observers. What what how, what comes next? As the you know we're no longer reporting on every single merger, and now it's moving to these strange outlying situations, right? Yes, I like to think of exoplanet research in terms of different eras of the science. And so I think at first we were in the era of discovery where we were really excited every time we found a new one. And now we're in the era of characterization where we're trying to learn more about individual planets or about uh, more about ensembles of planets together. So I think once we get to the point where individual black hole mergers uh, aren't that exciting, we have to look at the statistics of the mergers and yeah. look at whole populations of events and see if there are any trends uh, that we can 
piece out. Yeah, it's interesting. There are, you know, there are these various large observatories that are that are in the works, advanced, more advanced versions of LIGO. There's the Japanese, uh, I think it's the Kagra uh, one just came online. And then there's more advanced versions, even bigger observatories. And with space-based ones with LISA, et cetera, we may get to this point where, where we are aware of every single black hole merger that happens in the entire observable universe, every single one of them, and all the all of the white hole, uh, sorry, all of the white dwarf mergers, and all of the neutron star mergers, etc. You know, when you've got millions of events happening every year, you you're no longer concerned with them individually, but now you're learning about them on mass, right? What they all mean, yeah. and same thing. Yeah. You know, when we know about a hundred million exoplanets, right? Fingers we, crossed for that day. Yeah, I, I think twenty fifty. Is the <laughs> estimate that I heard. If you just if you follow the exponential growth curve, we will know of a hundred million exoplanets, fifty million exoplanets by twenty fifty. Wild. Yeah, and then you just you know it's not about the individual ones, although of course they'll be the outliers, but it is about them. On you know, seven. Yeah, you start. You start asking questions of how common are is this specific type of event or this specific type of exoplanet in that case. Huh. Yeah, yeah. And it's 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 kind of a neat, I mean, on the one hand, yeah, they all start to blend into the background noise of discovery. But on the other hand, it is pretty great to know that we're moving to this point. I, you know, other sciences have this all the time. You know, we don't freak out when we see another bird. Um, <laughs> right? Maybe you don't. <laughs> well, but no, not, not necessarily a north. new bird, but, you know, like another <laughs> robin. But when you, you know, when you measure tens of millions of robins, then you start to get some interesting uh, information. All right, Alan, what do you got for us? Yes. Yeah, it's a discovery made by looking at some old calibration or calibration or test data from the messenger mission um, from a couple of years back. Um, so, yeah, the messenger mission was sent out to study Mercury, uh, not Venus. Um, but to get to Mercury, it had to do a number of flybys past Venus and Earth um, because it turns out to get that close to the sun you have to shed a lot of velocity uh something i learned about in Kerbal space program yeah <laughs> is high delta v mission they're just, they're just a killer you know yeah like the, the, the sun is the hardest place to reach in the entire solar system yeah yeah so um on one of the flybys past venus the second one i believe in 2007 um the instrument scientist for the the um grns which is the gamma ray neutron spectrometer uh, they, they decided they need to test this instrument and point it at Venus and see what it gets. And they got some results and they were happy with that and off they went. Um, and that instrument just, by the way, that just distracted me so much figuring out what it was while I was reading up on this, you know, a neutron spectrometer, what is that? And it's just fascinating the way it works. You know, it's um, the idea is that cosmic rays strike an element or a molecule or something and then it's a neutron. And it detects those and because different um different substances absorb neutrons at different rates um that's why we use them as moderators in uh in nuclear reactors some of them uh, tr um, reduce the energy of those neutrons by a large amount and some by less and so this instrument by detecting these things and measuring their energy um you can get an idea of what what substance uh, emitted them which fascinated me. I didn't even heard of this before I uh, started reading this. Maybe I should have. But, you know. So, so what did we learn about the atmosphere of Venus? Uh, they discussed. They, they they worked out the nitrogen content and where the nitrogen is concentrated, um, which was something that we didn't really know about. And um, there was not just there was just wasn't very much curiosity about it. So these two, they were nuclear physicists. They're not even planetary scientists. Um, they they dredged up the old data and they had a look at it. Um, uh, build some computer models to, you know, to divide the atmosphere into different layers and uh, try to come up with a with something that matched the data that they got. And what they found was that the nitrogen is not evenly mixed with the atmosphere at all, which was, I think, the general assumption. But instead, was all concentrated in one specific belt, um, ranged from about fifty to hundred kilometers above the above the surface of Venus, which coincides uh, with the rather clear temperate region above the sulfurous hot high density hellscape that we normally <laughs> describe right. when, we, when we're describing venus right it's that area that um it's rather it's rather moderate you, you could survive there if you could just find a way to not 
fall. <laughs> right. um, so yeah, that's where all the, the nitrogen is. But what struck me about the story was not that discovery specifically, because I'll admit I'm not planetary scientist enough to be that fascinated by where the nitrogen is. But it's it's the way they got this. You know, this this um, these were not planetary scientists, and the data was not collected for any particular purpose at all beyond just you know turning the instruments on and seeing if it worked. Um, but they recorded it, and they went back and had a look. Um, they had remembered a paper that they'd read published back in 1962, which suggested measuring neutrons coming from an atmosphere could give you this kind of information. And they did that. And on top of all that, they wanted to do this and nobody cared. You know, they, they, they I think there were three runs, uh, three grants applications, all rejected. Just nobody wanted to pay them to do this work. And they were simply lucky that a colleague a uh, third colleague who happened to be working with this data, let them have a look, and they 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 got this result and published it just just recently. It's pretty fascinating how, like, you know, we can see Venus, and the thing that obscures our view of Venus are these stupid clouds, and yet to know actually know what the composition of these clouds has been has been pretty tricky. Part of the reason is we just don't have a lot of missions at Venus right now. Um, I mean, people are pretty surprised to learn that that Venus has twice the nitrogen in its atmosphere that we do on Earth, that people think that that, you know, it's all just carbon dioxide. Well, it's a lot of everything, including nitrogen. It's just that the the mix is off because it's, it's got so much carbon dioxide. And it, it, I don't know if you had read, um, there was a there was a paper that just came out, I think today, talking about how um, there's researchers think they have a, they have a pretty good idea, a better idea of where Earth's nitrogen came from, that it's definitely leading more to something that is a sort of that came later on after the Earth's formation, not came from inside the planet, but actually was probably delivered by, you know, the volatiles delivered by comets. And so you wonder if you get this situation on Venus as well, if the two were fed their night, their atmospheric nitrogen at roughly the, the same time and, and in the same way. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I love I well. love these, you know, we've seen this happen quite a few times. You've got some old mission that's long gone, but they keep the data around and someone goes, oh, I've got an idea for, um, and they dig through old Galileo data or they dig through old messenger data and they find out, uh, they're able to make an interesting discovery that tells us more about the, about the planet. I think Fred wants to say something. Oh, go ahead, Fred. Yeah. <laughs> No, look, I, um, I'm just wondering whether I can get you guys to help me do my job for me, because uh, yesterday I had a question from a Space Nuts listener, which was basically about the atmosphere of Venus. And uh, this question was, OK, the, the uh, pressure at the surface, kind of 100 times uh, Earth's atmospheric pressure, which is like pressure at half a kilometre in water or something of that sort. So the question was, would there be a height if, if you could survive Venus's atmosphere as a human dropped into Venus's atmosphere? Is there a height at which you would float? Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I sort of started researching Venus's atmosphere yesterday, which is why, Alan, your stuff is so interesting. Yeah. But I, I, I think the, the place where the atmospheric density is one, gram per cc or whatever units you want, is about 60 kilometers above the surface. And, and I think that's where it starts getting okay. <laughs> so high. would you float at that high? Uh, you know, what's your view of that? How do you answer a question like that? Um, well, I think, I, I mean, I think the answer is no, but Pamela, you might have, uh, you might have that answer as well. I don't think there's any place on Venus that you would actually be able to float in the atmosphere. Um, even though the pressure as you, you know, if you do get down to the surface is, you know, 93 times Earth's atmospheric pressure, you still sink, right? You, you still sink. Yeah. And the other problem that you have to deal with is tremendous crosswinds. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of turbulent motion. There's a lot of essentially wind-based undertow. And uh, if it wasn't the case, we wouldn't have been able to land anything on the surface because while we are hopefully lower density in our human bodies than our robot overlords, um, nonetheless, we rely on the fact that 
gravity still does its job and it's you're not going to be buoyant enough um that allows yeah. our missions that we plan to get to the surface yeah um, i imagine as you get further down the pressure is going to crush you a bit and your density will increase oh, yeah. and keep yeah. falling. <laughs> um, yeah. it's it's pretty interesting um nasa did did some research on potential new rovers to send and new missions to send to, to venus and one of the things they realized is that if they can send them to see some of the taller mountains that you actually are in way less atmospheric density and and you actually get a bit more access to sunlight to be able to power your your rover so if you can actually you know the tops of these mountains are some of the ideal places to try and send future future missions and then of course the thing that everyone's always so fascinated by is, is this idea that if you are up at in the tens of kilometers say in the 50 kilometer altitude range the 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 temperature and the atmospheric pressure are almost uh, Earth-like, uh, mm -hmm. and so you know you could walk around outside your spacecraft and not have to wear a spacesuit or too much of a of a warm coat. You would need a way to deal with the sulfuric acid, but yeah. you know, yeah. and to breathe the carbon dioxide. But apart from yeah. that, um, yeah, you could <clears throat> and That's and small uh, potatoes. What was that? That's small potatoes. Yeah, you can do that. yeah. Yeah, and the fact that you are still stuck now, you're stuck in Venus's gravity well, uh, yeah. and with no firm foundation beneath you. But but still, a lot of people are are fascinated by that idea. It's the most Earth-like place in the solar system, is the upper atmosphere of Venus. Pamela, we've got time for one last story. <laughs> okay, so we have a sweetheart story coming to us from the Spitzer spacecraft. Uh, this beloved little infrared observer was turned down turned off decommissioned on January 30th after outliving its life by nearly 10 years. And um, so today we are still though, and we will continue for the next decade or more, getting new scientific results out of all of the information that it captured. And this week they shared a tremendous image that was the very last mosaic, a, a image of many images that was taken by Spitzer, and this was a mosaic of the California Nebula. Now, infrared observatories have the great ability to look through most dust. Now, really big, bulky dust molecules are gonna block all light. Um, but the fine grained stuff that we deal with in, in this particular nebula, it's blocking the visible light, but it's let, letting the longer infrared light through. And Spitzer was able to find a beautiful little tiny spiral galaxy just hiding on the other side of the California Nebula. And it's just amazing to think how much is out there that we just haven't seen yet because we haven't had a survey infrared telescope with enough resolution and enough collecting area to well, see all these little things. So it's, it's just one of these, we're still gonna have to wait a little bit longer to get all the science out of this image, but for now, this is the last mosaic Spitzer had to offer, and it has a sweet little cute spiral galaxy we don't know nearly enough about hiding in that image. Um, I mean, it's thanks to telescopes like Spitzer that we can even see through the core of the Milky Way. Oh, yeah. And so the fact that you can see a galaxy on the other side of the California Nebula, that's classic Spitzer. And, and my, my hat is off to the Spitzer team because this mission was really only planned to go to 2010, 2011. And it was expected that the JWST would be launching about 2011. <laughs> or W first. And, right, and just total not W first. We hadn't dreamed of W first yet in 2011. But uh, we, we were planning on JWST launching and just basically making Spitzer not even necessary anymore because JWST was gonna have so much more collecting power, so much better resolution, no need for Spitzer. And they worked their butts off to keep that mission going and going and going so that we wouldn't have a gap in our coverage of the infrared sky. But Spitzer was put in a trailing orbit. It wasn't orbiting the earth, wasn't orbiting the earth moon system, it's orbiting the sun. 
and its orbit is such that it just gets a little bit further away from us over time. And it reached the point where its batteries were old. It was having trouble holding charge. And it was just taking so much energy to send data back to us at this great distance. So now we have a gap in our ability to study the infrared universe up until unknown date because plague times yes oh now i'm now i'm starting to think about further delays of james webb thanks to coronavirus <sighs> yeah all right uh well we've reached the end of our hour uh so it's time to bid a fond farewell to all of my co-hosts uh i'm gonna start with you moya um, where can people find out more and what are you working on? Although we now know it's going to involve a, a certain uh, catalog of information. Right. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, my handle is GoAstroMo. And I've recently started taking my live caveat show uh, and putting it online. So I, I started a YouTube channel. Fantastic. Uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, the show is called ExoLore. And in it, I interview expert guests and we imagine what the life and culture might be like on an alien planet. Awesome. Well, now now we have to do a, a collab. So I'll uh, have you come on my YouTube channel and we'll nice. shamelessly promote your work. Um, <laughs> cool. Alan, what are you working on? Where can people find out more? Uh, same as last time, uh, Urban is Fun of a Podcast is still about to launch its uh, third season. Um, as you can imagine, and into the world is... Uh, uh, sapping my energy a bit, but uh, <laughs> yep. but I'm hoping to push that out in the next 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 week or two. Fantastic, uh, yeah. Pamela, I am busy over at CosmoQuest.org, and I'd love to give a shout out to all the people in the simulcast on Twitch. Yeah, um, we are busy uh, working to bring more and more content to keep all the people who are stuck in their houses happily engaged in well creating science content and we're working creating software to get more citizen science going now as part of this we're also embracing the silly because we need more laughter during plague times and one of the things that we've introduced is community coffee at 10 a.m uh, eastern 7 a.m pacific on twitch.tv slash CosmoQuestX. And tomorrow morning, we are going to be celebrating and cursing the asteroid Bennu, which is rocks on rocks with boulders and more rocks and a little bit of dust. And uh, I'm going to be building rice crispy asteroids while talking asteroid science. So tune in twitch.tv slash CosmoQuestX. All right, Fred, you stuck around. You were rewarded with a second uh, opportunity to remind people where to find out more and uh, show off your book again. Well, thank you very much, Fraser. So I forgot to mention uh, my Twitter handle is at StargazerFred, uh, which seems like a good one. Yes, the Space Nuts podcast and darkskytraveler.com.au. That's where you'll find me online. And the book is Exploding Planets. No, it's not. It's Exploding Stars and Invisible Planets or something to that effect. <laughs> Thanks right very much. Um, uh, so uh, we had a fantastic interview over on my channel this week with uh, Dr. Uh, Kevin Peter Hand, who was the writer of Alien Oceans. He is the uh, he is one of the people working on the Europa Clipper mission. So if you want to learn about uh, missions to Europa and the ice worlds of the solar system, check that out. On Monday, uh, I've got Das Valdez from uh, Twitch joining me, and he's of course doing some incredible coverage of everything that SpaceX is doing. So we're going to be chatting about that on Monday. So you're definitely going to want to join me. All right, I'm going to put everybody back on the screen so we can all say goodbye. There we all are. Uh, as always, a huge thank you to everyone who watched it today. Thanks to the moderators. Thanks to everyone both on YouTube and on Twitch. We haven't forgotten about you. Um, we appreciate all of the comments and everyone who is being active both behind the scenes and in the show. Huge thank you as always to, uh, to Nancy Graziano, Susie Murph, and the rest of the executive producers for helping to put together this show. Again, couldn't do it without you. All right. We will see all of you next week. Everybody stay safe and stay sane. See you later. Thanks again. Bye. Bye. Thanks for having me.